Father, we uh, confess to you our, our need for you and also uh, that we brought somebody in with us today, each one of us called our flesh, that is going to fight for room to speak and to live. And we come before you, Lord, we thank you for the cross you've given, not only for the substitutionary sin atonement, you've also given us a cross to have fellowship with, to take up daily. And that we can, you've, you've tailored, built a, a cross so for each of us to take our flesh, our intellect, our emotions, our ambition, our sin, and put it on the cross and say, this is what you're worthy for, death. And as we get small, like a child, unfettered, that's where you speak. For we know the spirit and the flesh oppose each other. Today we pray the spirit would rise up. We pray the spirit would commune with you. We pray that this would be a time of worship, of spirit and truth before the Father. And you, Lord, would speak to your children. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you. I have said this that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. I have great confidence in you. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged. In all of our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. For when we came to Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about how you, your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. I repeat, my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but, not only, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorrow, sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful, as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leads to no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or of the injured party, but rather that before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted you are to us you are. By all of this, we are encouraged. In addition to our encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. I had boasted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. And his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, perceiving him with fear and trembling. I am glad. I can have complete confidence in you. I need a handout. Do we have an extra handout? Oh, thank you. We got one. Thank y'all. All right. Just a couple notes before we get going. And to break down this word, uh, we've picked a date to relocate this class to the chapel. It's going to be on the uh, 11th of April. 
be mindful that there is a meditation class in there. So uh, either join them for meditation or hesitate outside. We have a beautiful new hallway redecorated. Feel free to go and fellowship out there. Uh, it'll also allow us to display on the screen certain things, including upcoming events. It's a better microphone system. Uh, we also have hymnals and music, musical instruments in there so we can uh, more readily be prepared to sing praises to God whenever we feel like it or we're supposed to. So uh, I'm excited about that and it will also solve our, pro our parking problem. All right. So he starts off with the, with the first verse. And he says, since we have these promises, then he's, he's referring back to the last uh, five chapters he's written. Uh, we have all these promises. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and the spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Uh, literally, it translates purge pollutants, uh, detox. Um, now that we know these promises, don't accommodate things that you know are unhealthy for you. I'm real careful when it comes to uh, smear campaigns, uh, but there's one going on right now, it may be true, about Diet Coke. I don't know if you've read that, but there, the studies are linking Diet Coke to physical problems, even Alzheimer's down the road. Uh, research that yourself. I'm just using this as an example. But let's say it, it's true, and let's say you're convicted of that, and you love Diet Coke. What are you going to do? <laughs> Drink that. I mean, if if you if you could if you could experience now what you will experience later, you'll repent. That means you'll change. You just want you won't smoke cigarettes if you find out what that'll do to you. You wouldn't uh, you, you wouldn't do many of the things you do now if you if you could see what damage that actually has on your physical body, but also how it how it um, arrests your spiritual life. Now, Diet Coke's a bad example, but it's just an example. Um, in the same way, what he's saying is don't tolerate impurities in your life. One of the big words that came to me this week through a prayer partner of mine is let urgency dictate. I want to write that one down. Let urgency dictate. Now this doesn't mean be rushed or scared. What that means is we're in a season right now that if you know you're supposed to be doing something, do it. Uh, that sin, one of the great sins right now in this season would be hesitation. Deferred obedience is not obedience. So, in the same spirit, what he's saying is we have these great promises why would you make room for accommodating things that have nothing to do with your, with your future with Jesus Christ? So, um, he steps it down in three, in three ways. First, he says, uh, purge pollutants. The next thing he says is, this produces in you a perfected holiness, that, that a sanctification over time starts to create in you more and more holiness for Christ. There's a popular scripture in Revelation 3 that's quoted a lot of times, I think, in, inappropriately by evangelists. Um, it's the one where Jesus says, Behold, I stand and knock. Maybe it's Revelation 4, but it's, Behold, I stand and knock at the door. If you'll open, and I'll come in and I'll dine with you. I've heard some evangelists say, um, Jesus is knocking on every heart. He's cold, he's wet, won't you let Jesus in? Yeah, he's knocking at every heart. Uh, who's Jesus writing to in that letter? His church. Okay. Is he writing to everybody? He's writing to the church, saying to the born again, to the Christian, every day I'm knocking, and you can participate and let more of me come in. Uh, that entry of Jesus to parts of your life is going to expand holiness in your life. I joked in our second service on Sunday, you can't kind of let the FBI in your home. <laughs> You know, they're there. They have your computer now. Here it is. So, in the same way, the process of allowing Jesus more sovereignty, that is a, that is a, a, a great use of your free will to submit to Jesus. The best thing you can do with your free will is to give up your will. It is, that, that's not a scripture for get saved. That's not how salvation works. 
Um, so this move of God to the church is saying every single day, urgently invite Jesus to do what he's going to do to you. The greatest thing that's going to take place to you today is, is not what the world's going to see. It's the unseen reality of how God's going to touch you, how he's going to move in you, what he's going to deliver you from and show to you. Many of your prayer partners will amen and confirm what you're going through with Christ, and you should for them as well. The rest of the world just won't understand. But your greatest story, uh, Jesus says, um, come to me in the secret place. You know what your prayer closet ultimately is? It's your spirit. Come to me in your inner sanctum, and I will reward you in secret. To those who pray publicly and everyone's clapping, they have their reward. But to you who know me, secretly, you come to me in a place that's discerned, and I will expand. So you, you, you say, I don't want these pollutants in my life. There's things about my life that are, are cursed and need to be on the cross. Uh, I shouldn't carry them past the cross, but hang them on the cross. Jesus is trying to perfect holiness in my life. And ultimately, the, what's the final outcome? That last sentence of, of the last piece of verse 1, what does it say? Reverence, Reverence for God. So one great, one great sign that you're, you're being perfected in Christ is that you have a growing fear of the Lord, a reverence for Dad. You, you've lost um, the three enemies of God. I've been teaching recently with a group is the, the devil, the world, and your flesh. Hopefully none of you are experiencing a demonic issue. Uh, for a while, most of us experience a worldly issue. We're really swayed by other people. We start out as man-pleasers. Uh, God can free you from that at any moment. He's ready to do it right now. Because he said you can't love both him and the world. At the, when, when push comes to shove, you'll deny Jesus and run with the world. That's what Peter did. Uh, the final enemy is the one that's got most of us very, very strongly, and that's our flesh. Your flesh... Um, your flesh doesn't know how to tremble before God. Um, your flesh doesn't know how to submit to God on its own. Your intellect won't earn you righteousness with Jesus. And so every single day it's this passionate plea of the Holy Spirit inside of you to say, I want Jesus to move in my life so that my whole story today is that I'm trembling and quivering before the Lord. I want Jesus Christ to be revered in my life. We've preached before about uh, the Lord's Prayer. What's the first line? Hallowed. That's just an idea until it becomes a reality by the power of the Holy Spirit. But whatever you hallow determines, it becomes your most central object in your life. Whatever you hallow determines your confession, determines your breakthrough. If you're hallowing your career and not the Father, then the worst sins you commit are the things that damage your career. You see? God is putting Christ, Father, Spirit as the center revealed object of your desire. It changes every single thing. But it's got to be a daily movement, a daily a decision, if you will, a fight to say, I don't want to revere anything other than God. And to confess that every single day, my flesh, which is an idol-making machine, will come up with something else to revere. Right? So that's the, that's, he, he hits that hard, and then he moves out of this long digression, this lasted for five chapters. Um, so he then says, make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. And he's, this whole time he's been building this case. Like, this is the unseen reality. This is what we're all about. Now he's, he's boldly pleading with them. Let's move forward. Um, verses, chapters 2, 14 through 7, 5. It's a long dis uh, digression that ends with, Make room for us in your hearts. Allow me to boast in what Christ is doing in you. It, let me be encouraged by you and let us walk in victory. That's his ultimate plea as apostle over this church. 
in verse 5, he, he gets back to, um, he steps out of this unseen reality talk, and he gets into actual travel itinerary. Do you remember that's how we started? And he says, uh, uh, For when we came to Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest. We were harassed. Uh, we were discomforted. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by who? Titus. By Titus. So, Paul spent five chapters talking about amazing unseen realities that are very real. Uh, they are truer than what you see with your eyes. That's the whole point of faith. What's unseen is more real than what's seen. It's the whole point. You almost have to use your imagination to see how the angels and the Lord and everything works. So Paul's making a point now. Now all this unseen reality, all of these things that really matter, do take place and reveal themselves and manifest themselves in seen ways. You see? So just because it's unseen, the value, the worth, the real story is concealed and cloaked and veiled. We've talked about that already. Veiled to many people. These miracles of God, His sovereignty, will actually appear in real time, in real ways. As in, these aren't just ideas. And for him, what he's saying is, y'all may not understand this, maybe you do now, now that we've talked through this letter, but the day I ran into Titus was one of the biggest days of my life. And you may have that same story. You know, people, people don't know your story, but when you say, it was an idle Tuesday, and I was just going around, and, and I just had a breakdown at the grocery store, and I turned the corner, and there was, there was a suit. And she doesn't know this, but I'm going to tell her right now. That day was the greatest day of my life. And here's why. I was praying to God. I was discomforted, and he showed up. So Paul is actually taking a huge spiritual reality and putting it on the calendar. This is a big breakthrough day for Paul, who himself will confess he is still a growing Christian every day. He still has to deal with his own flesh. He wrote Romans, didn't he? The War Within. So, uh, on your notes, I've written that Paul and Titus reunite to include a report from Corinth. So, Paul, um, Paul and Titus were coming in different directions. Sorry, Scott, I'm ruining our board situation. Uh, remember, originally, Paul was going to uh, come from this part of the world over to, to Corinth, up here, and then back through Corinth on the way home. And instead of going this way, he changed his plans to, to go the long way around and then winter in Corinth. Instead of two short visits, he decided to do one long visit. While he's going counterclockwise, who's coming clockwise? Titus. Titus. Paul had calculated that they would meet, I think, I forget, in one of these cities. Paul got there, Titus wasn't there. He waited, Titus wasn't there. So he's gotten a report about how uh, distracted the church in Corinth has gotten, which is tough enough. And also, he's, his friend, his partner in ministry, the guy that he can, he can be just completely honest with all the time, he's not there. So that's where this story picks up. So Paul's saying, in addition to me changing my plans, and I have the authority to do that, you need to understand, I was going through something when I received your letter of all these complaints, of all these false teachers, and I was... I was in a weak place myself. But then I rounded the corner and went a little further, got up to Macedonia, and I ran into who? I ran into Titus. And Titus had just come from you. And you know what Titus told me? He said, there's been a miracle. He said, y'all are one of the healthiest churches we have. That worship and praise and love and spirit and courage and... I believe it, but it's hard. My flesh doesn't believe it. My spirit does. And I'm so encouraged by his report. How blessed are the feet that bring good news. So Paul's saying, this is his point. So Paul moves from the unseen reality, which is his game plan and his motivation, to the seen reality because miracles take place in real time in real places. And so this is, this is this balance between the kingdom of God versus Paul's travel itinerary. And that's the beautiful thing. To, to the unseen, untrained, unspiritual person, you're just walking around your life doing your thing. 
But if you've been regenerated, born again, and you're practicing listening for the Lord, walking in holiness, you're in a fellowship that, that puts a premium on holiness and prayer and scripture and gospel, everything you do is holy. Everywhere you go, you're looking for Jesus. And you're always asking one question, Father, what are you doing here at J&B? What are you, what, what are you, what are you about today? I don't want to miss it. I don't want to privilege the seen reality above the unseen reality. So Paul, um, he writes, just says, you know, this is what happened. I ran into Titus. He told me some great things. Verse 8 says, so I just need to let you know, even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it. I love Paul because he doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, do what? He's ambivalent. Yes. Uh, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. So maybe he's saying, you know, I did, uh, there was a moment I experienced regret, but I had to let the game plan work out. Now I don't regret that I regretted it, and I regretted it now, no more. So, you know, back then, you know, once you write something, it's down. So, you know, that's the way it is. Uh, I've written some notes on this whole thing about back and forth on regret. Um, literally, the word means, and I've written it, change after being with, uh, with, uh, I need to put a comma. Change with being with out of care. Um, so regret means that you or your perception changes after being with someone or a situation and you have more care. It's literally translation in Greek. So regret is normally an experiential, exper experiential moment where you're, you, you are changing and now you care more. That's the essence of regret. Um, no regret means, after all, I wouldn't change a thing. That's what that means. So uh, sometimes regret means you wish you could change what you did. Spiritual regret means I'm grateful that God is changing me today and every day. I think this is what he's getting at. There's this back and forth kind of semantics that I think the Greeks understood better than we do. But Paul's saying something along the lines of, I wouldn't have changed a thing, and I'm changing. So however you want to say that. Words are fun. Last thing I wrote, regret. I would change something, and namely that would be myself would change. So it's this back and forth process. That's the beauty of the providence of God. The plans and purposes of God, there's no regret. God is the one who says from the Lord, from the heavens, I am doing exactly what you would do if you knew everything I know. And, uh, you know, I've been done a lot of reflecting in Christ recently on these thoughts burst up at different times that aren't really intellectual, they're more spirit-based on, on the, the providence of God, the sovereignty of God. And, and you know, if God's not sovereign, He's not God. That's the word I heard. And so that means the things we go through, the actual events, given enough time, Given enough time, we wouldn't change a thing. That's what no regrets means. That's really bold to say, isn't it? I think some of that is healed in the resurrection and in the redemption. The unjust suffering, for sure. But what that means is simultaneous is, if I'm going to trust God, I have to trust His plan. And I have to trust His timing. I have to trust His redemption. I have to trust His vindication. I have to trust the fact that there are things that aren't right that leave room for vengeance for me, says the Lord, right? And I also have to say, but I'm regretful all day, which means I'm changing things I did yesterday. Me. And that change is primarily verse 1. That change is primarily purging yourself of yourself. The meditative say ego. Yeah. Amen? It's this 
And it's a real important concept. I think we're going to do a series. Uh, we're going to we're going to do John in here next. But I think we're going to do a sermon series not on John but on flesh. Um, this is critical to understand about the essence of the gospel. And if you if you miss this, then you can make the Bible say whatever you want. But if the gospel is true, this is what what this means. Jesus did not come to enhance your life. He came to came to give you a completely new one. And if you believe Jesus came to give you an enhanced life, then there's room for your flesh. If you believe that He came to give Bible, born again, new creation, new life, dead in transgression, alive in Christ, He who knew no sin became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God, which means a completely new person, absolutely. What that means then is that your whole process of growth in Christ is to daily push your old guy out so that the Spirit of God has freedom to grow the new guy. They are not compatible. They are opposed. That's critical. And so if you're still kind of on the fence between why did Jesus come, what does the Holy Spirit do, He comes to... I've heard you've got a God-sized hole in your life that only God... No, you don't. Where does that say that? You are a God-sized hole. Your whole, but you don't have a part of you missing. The whole thing. You see, that's the good news: is a new life, no regrets. And if you're embarrassed, good, because your old guy doesn't know what he's doing, but your new guy's trying to get out. That's why we say, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is. Freedom for him. So he goes on and he, he talks about regret. And then he, he uh, I love that he says in verse 10, he talks about sorrow and regret. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leads to no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. On your notes, I've written even the, the difficult parts of the Christian, of Christianity brings life. Even the worst parts is life. And life is explicitly described here as salvation and no turning back. Again, repentance means returning to the scene of the crime to change something if you could. Right? What this means is when God moves in your life, you're saved, there's no turning back. You're glad it happened. Wouldn't change it. Verse 11 uh, says, see what godly sorrow, see, uh, that's that word, right? Behold is what he says. Behold, this is what godly sorrow has produced in you. So not only is he going to just refer that this is good, let's talk about exactly what's happened. I've written out the, the things, um, that I've, I've put them into English, but behold, uh, the main thing that's happened is conviction. I, this church right now is brimming with conviction, um, and I think it's sorrow-based, repentant-based, um, many times joy-based. But we've had a lot of people, particularly in the life group I'm in, experience amazing things. Um, true convictions, where their life is now fundamentally changed. That's the, if you want to look for a, a pray the Jones, you want a, you want a revival, you want to see if this is authentic revival, rain is great. I love rain. Change lives is better. That's what's happening. That's why I believe in this stuff. We've had, and I love rain, again, when, when, a, when a human being hates something they used to love. What? Let me repeat that. When a human being hates something they used to love because they've met the true love of their life, and they're hungry for things they used to not be hungry for, in, in this case, the Word of God. Oh my gosh, can you, behold, can you see? This is revival. These are the fruits of a revived church of Jesus Christ on earth. A true, repentant spirit, a, a, a hunger for the Word of God, a, a desire for truth, even if it hurts. They want clarity. A love of God, love of neighbor. And it, just a dogged devotion to God's ways and everything. This is repentance. This is revival. This is, this is what's happening. So he's saying this sorrow, in this case for this church. Again, Paul's gone. He's hearing a report from Titus. And he's writing them this letter saying... It's cool because he's writing this letter upset at first, even knowing he's had his report from Titus, by the way. Isn't that cool? 
Like he's got the good news and he's still kind of mad about those, te- those false teachers. He's gotten to this point of the letter saying, now, throughout this process, with me not even there, these are the best things when the preacher's not there, God's Spirit, through a letter He let me write to you, has produced in you a holy conviction. In this holy conviction, what's happened? Paul says uh, several things. Number one is a holy conviction uh, makes you move quickly, brings intellectual reasoning, like things start to make sense. Good anger, particularly at yourself, <laughs> at your flesh, uh, awe and respect, true desire, hot enough to boil over, uh, that can either mean love or anger, your interpretation, and true justice. This proves that you are holy, an object of grace and not of wrath. To say that this proves that you're innocent is what the English version I have. Let's see, in verse 11, you may have a different, a different thing. Let's see. Uh, At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent. What does yours say? Innocent? Purity of heart. I don't like the word innocent because that means like we did something better than somebody else. And that's not the gospel. We're not, we're not sinless. We need a redeemer. And so it's not our behavior that saved us. What I saw is it's the actual word hagios, which means holy, purity of heart. What this means is two people can go through the same event, and your experience of that event is it doesn't save you, but it's an, expre- it's a, it's an assurance that you are saved. Um, only God saves you, not you. And so two guys die on the cross. Two had completely different experiences. One fell in love with Jesus, one mocked Jesus. Two people have a rebuking letter from their pastor. <laughs> well, one hates the church now. I'm never going back to church. Paul wrote this mean letter to me, and I'm no, no. And the other person is struck by the Holy Spirit. So Paul's saying, even if you hadn't had this experience, if you're saved, you're saved. But that you've had this experience, this experience, this should be for you another blessed assurance. You know, we can have assurance of our salvation. When you experience something that could have, in the world's eyes, brought you discouragement, it brought you conviction. What? Paul's saying, behold, good news for you, it looks like you're going to heaven. (laughs) And it's not because you respond this way. That's up to God. Your ability to respond to this way is a holy thing. Mm -hmm. It means that when God moves in your life, an object of wrath hates God. An object of grace loves God. Same act. God will do the same act on this earth and some will experience, they will submit to the Lord in praise and some will submit to the Lord in wrath. This, this, is, this is what he's getting after. He's not saying you're a perfect person. He's saying when God moves in your life, your response is quickness, intelligent reasoning, good anger, respect, true desire, hot enough to boil over with love and anger and true justice. When you're convicted by God, that's a good sign. Verse 12 says, So even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong. Isn't this cool? I'm not writing about him or the person who got hurt, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. You could see how this love works. You could see that we have an eternal relationship, that the covenant of Christ is real. It's an expression of the holy union of the church. He goes on to say, um, well, he, he writes a lot of things, but I, I paused here on the notes and pulled out Romans 8, 28. Again, a reminder, all things work out for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes. Things that you go through, this is great, like you can't lose. Even when you put your foot in your mouth, even when you, even when you embarrass yourself, even when you have a, a backslide moment, God's Spirit is messing with you and causing you to repent. The final product of every single thing a Christian experiences or participates in is glory for God. It'll come with either you're obeying God or you're disobeying God and you're about to repent. He's glorified by repentance. He's glorified by confession. He's glorified by you being weak and broken and Him sweeping in to save you. He's glorified when when His Spirit is full inside of you and He doesn't have to save you every single day because you're actually walking in the Spirit for once. He's glorified because He's glorified because He's glorified. And He's elected you to be a vehicle, a dance floor, so that no matter what you go through, He's going to get a lot out of it. So if you're going through a difficult time, don't give up. 
just glorify God. He's going to do it. It's unstoppable. Romans, I love Romans, we'll get to that too, but Romans is just very clear that everything the Holy Church goes for, goes through and goes into, is ultimately going to produce a harvest of righteousness for God. Even the hard stuff. Yep. It seems like what he's talking about here also is his one of his very basic beliefs of whether it's you know, a good Christ thing or a bad Christ thing, you're still talking about Christ. And that's always good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether you're doing it from selfish ambition. Yeah, it's... He's, at that point, he's actually talking about false teachers. Yes. So he's not talking about these guys. However, what this, to the same point, there's like no no uh, no publicity is bad publicity for Jesus. Right. So God, it's also I mean you go eternal and you go to cosmic like huge overscaping. Uh, there's a weird belief that says God is only going to be glorified by saving people. He'll also be glorified by condemning people. That's what Romans says. He's, I don't know if it's just as glorified, but we know. He said, I will be glorified by my objects of mercy as I will be glorified by my objects of wrath. I mean, it's Revelation, Romans. I mean, so, yeah, the, the, you are involved in a game plan of a sovereign Lord, which is, begins and ends, and all in between is full of glory. And this is your walk. And part of, the, part of the Christian life is to wake up in the unseen reality and say, even the way I fail is for God's glory. Even the way I'm bored is for God's glory. At any moment, I love the providence of God. I want to just take one second. Oh gosh, don't squeal on me. Are we good on April 11th? Yes. All right. Analogies are always imperfect and incomplete, so please uh, bear with me. God's purpose in your life is glory. That's His purpose in your life. Everything you'll go through... Uh, People love, people love the subordinate purposes. Preacher, mom, dad. Those are way less than the big purpose. You are destined to glory God. That's His purpose in your life. And the way you glorify God is let Him love you, let Him shine, let Him be boasted about. And so He has a purpose for you. When He's redeemed your life, He meets you. And He says, Mike, from here on out, this is what my Spirit's walking you toward. I, ha I know every word. I know every conversation. I know exactly where I want you to maximize your experience of abundant life and my experience of glory on earth as it is in heaven. Now, Mike and Paul and all of us, we take about 1.2 seconds of obedience, and then we step off the deal. Can I get a witness? <laughs> All right. Okay. There's a lot of belief that says your job is, that believes that repentance means climbing back up on this path. Retracing your steps, doing an, that's what counseling is all about. Autopsy, where did I go wrong? Where did they go wrong? We need to figure, but you know, that doesn't actually pro problem solve what's next. It only keeps looking back. So a lot of people believe that God has a plan for me. Oh gosh, and I need to I need to get up on the path God has for me. Here's what I see. When you get here, God says, "I love you." Oh, I love you. Nothing can change that. Here you are. Forget this. Now, from here, here's your perfect route. And you walk about 3.8 seconds, sometimes 45 if you're feeling good, and you get up here. And God said, look at him, he's trying to get back where he was. Huh? <laughs> Have you ever heard the phrase, you want to hear, make God laugh? Mm -hmm. Tell him your plan. 
You know, just here you are. Here you are trying again. You're trying. That means your flesh is trying. You're not dying to self. You're not living for Christ. But you're doing it with lots of Jesus words and you're quoting lots of scripture. So there you are. And God says, okay, well, that's where you are. Now I'm going to raise these. And then here. God is not on a path up here. You're down here. God's not up here waiting for you. God's with you. That's what Emmanuel means. The whole point of repentance isn't getting back on the right track. The whole point of repentance is getting back into a booming relationship with Jesus that you actually acknowledge now. It's about your companion. And that, that's, the, that's the whole joy of a repentant Christian. It's your ability to repent. It's the biggest word in the Bible. What do I need to do to be saved? Repent, be baptized. What do I need to do to grow? What do I need to do to find courage? Repent. What do I need to do to worship well? Repent. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He make, came to make dead people live. And the operative thing about our repentance is actually looking with eyes that work now and hearing. Those who have eyes to see and ears that hear, the joy is not uh, doing big things for God. It's looking at God. And when He, I mean, if you look, if you're beholding Jesus, whatever you're doing in that moment is completely obedient to Him. When you're enamored in the Holy Spirit, even if you aren't moving, if you, even if you are in a hospital bed, paralyzed, if you are beholding Jesus in that moment, you are exercising exceptional peace and obedience. It's easier to sell hard work than it is beholding. It's easier to say, some guy's knocking at your door, you best open it. So you can get saved. Then it's, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. So the, the joy, the, the ability, Paul's writing to a church, he's hoping, he's begging, he's writing, he's seeking for one thing, for the church to repent. To experience life. And it's happened. So Paul ends this letter, this chapter, by saying, by all of this, verse 13, what? We are encouraged. I'm a pastor. I think, I'm assuming this is true for most people. Once you've come alive in Christ and walked in the Spirit, the biggest, most, the thing that puts the bit in your mouth when you're feeling down, in addition to knowing Jesus, is either you hearing from Jesus personally are you seeing somebody you care about hear from Jesus personally? That's it. Everything else is supplemental, preparatory, and interesting. But it doesn't actually do it for you. When one of your kids calls you and says, Mom? Dad? <coughs> when one of y'all texts me and says, Paul, you wouldn't believe this. Although I do. Yeah, I've got to start it out that, right? You wouldn't believe this. This is what I, this would have happened to me. That, that's the number one thing. That encourages the church. That's why testimony is so important to pile in on itself. We are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially de delighted to see how happy who? Titus. Titus is a kid on one of our soccer teams, I coach. He's awesome. How t little guy. Titus was, and he's always happy, uh, because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. I had boasted to him about you, and you had not you've not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. You know, a church will say, you put out on your billboard, uh, First Christian Church, we're a welcoming church. We're a loving church. Well, don't put that, I'll tell you if you're welcoming. You don't have to, if you have to tell me you're loving, there's probably something you're hiding. <laughs> If you begin a sentence with honestly, there's probably some not honesty there. What Paul's saying is, I talked to Titus that you are an authentic church of the Holy Ghost. And whatever the Holy Ghost is moving in, whatever Jesus is alive in, that's a place of love and welcome and encouragement. And so I, I was telling Titus that there's this church that he, 
he's let me start and, I, and I'm writing letters to you and he's going to come visit one day. And all I've told Titus is, it's a church, go and see for yourself. Come and see. Behold what God is able to do in Corinth, which is probably the most sexualized, weird culture of that day. I don't know if you know about Corinth. It's a weirdo place. Uh, like Austin. Like Austin. <laughs> it's, it's where Mardi Gras was invented, you know, and so he's like, dude, you're going to go to the, and I'm not going to say a word. I'm not going to prep you. I'm just going to boast that these people are God's elect. These people have been moved by the Holy Spirit. These people have been ramrodded by the Lord. And, and there's false teachers, there's problems, and it bothers me all the same, but I bet the day you go, you're going to be blown away. How God will take a, a sinner and turn them into a saint, even in Corinth. Even a Corinthian. And he went there, and what happened? As Titus was freaking out. He's like, you're right, you're right. You know, I, I knew you were right, but I didn't know you were right. And then, you know, you know how that works. And he, he comes to find Paul. And so on your notes, um, several things occur from this transaction that's going to lead to the rest of the letter. Number one, Paul is filled with courage. When you're in charge of something, like a family, or a pastorate, or a job, or a career, or a business, or something, and the things underneath you are doing well by grace, not by effort, by the Lord, it makes you courageous. It makes you take that. Our church is in a position of courage, aren't we? We're about to take a big step for college ministry on the basis of the vision God's given us, but also all of the signs and testament I'm getting from y'all. It, it puts <laughs> courage in the pastor. Uh, Titus is filled with joy. Who doesn't want that? The church is healthy. Paul was not put to shame. These are just four examples of what comes about when we let God handle a broken problem. Everyone in Christ wins. If you're not in Christ, don't know. But everyone in Christ wins. He goes on, he writes about uh, uh, ultimately trembling. Uh, I am glad, I, I am glad, verse 16, I can have complete confidence in you. So what Paul's saying, because he says consistently, and the word is boast. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, in Christ. So how's he saying this? How's he able to, how, with integrity, how can he say that? What he's saying is mystery of mysteries. Miracle of miracles. Which one of my favorite songs from Fiddler on the Roof. God's done it again. He has, he, he has incarnated Himself in sinners by the power of the Holy Spirit in an authentic church, a true love for the church, so that what's happening here is worthy of praise. Uh, one of the things that's been on my heart that's going to come with this college ministry is that a lot of the things we do as church is seed planting, uh, not feasting. We don't party well. Uh, we had a group go to Puerto Rico, and after every worship service, they're salsa dancing. That's got to get fixed. God's going to do that. I can't like say, everyone learn to salsa dance. But God, <laughs> the, point, the point is, at the end, a church is a people who is not just obedient, not just smart, not just faithful, but delighting. And when you push that direction, when your desires are true for the Lord, for the Father in Christ, and somebody comes to visit, and they're refreshed and they're rejuvenated, not with unholy joy, but holy joy. Not unholy desire, but holy desire. That's awesome. That's it's life. It quickens a person. It, it, it allows Titus to stay longer than he planned so that he wouldn't be hitting Paul when Paul thought he would hit him. And Paul now understands why Titus was so late, because he was partying with the Corinthians. That's the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. This is what the church is designed to be and do. A repenting people who rejoice, who do life with God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the unseen meeting the seen reality and the true story of Christ 
occurring. And St. Paul uh, being chosen to write this letter and it to be sealed and delivered to Lubbock. We thank you, Lord, that these include real people with real flesh and real Jesus. We thank you that nothing is impossible with God, even a revived church, even a Corinthian church. We thank you that boasting is always in the Lord, and when we see the Lord at work in the lives of the members of the church, in the lives of the saints of Christ, we can boast not in ourselves, but in Jesus, who alone is the hope of heaven inside by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the daily invitation to die unto ourselves and live for Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that has been given and guaranteed to remain, preach, move, and empower the Church of Jesus Christ until we step into your kingdom. We thank you for the season we're in. and We pray in the name of Jesus Christ that we would take all things, all things, and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.